You want a war? You're gonna get one. Forget the lies, the money. We're in this together and through it all. They said that nothing's forever. Welcome back to Reliving the War and welcome to the 27th of October 1997. It's the night after Halloween Havoc 97 and WCW decided to put on a 3 hour episode of Nitro this week. Nitro comes live from San Diego, California while WWF Raw's War comes from Tulsa, Oklahoma. We'll look at Nitro's first 60 minutes or so before comparing shows and see what they put on first in their Halloween Havoc Fallout show. Check out the video I uploaded on Sunday if you want to learn all about the pay per view. Previous jam up guy Chase has done it again. Last time he went to WrestleMania repping Reliving the War, and then just last week he attended AEW Dynamite with his daughter Chloe. Their wrestling bio sign was caught on camera as they sat in the front row, so Chase becomes a two time jam up guy while Chloe becomes our first ever jam up guy. I'm up girl. Thanks so much guys and thanks to Chase's friend Corey for sending me the awesome photo. Alright, let's do it then. This is Reliving the War episode 105. We've got Hollywood Hogan and Eric Bischoff kicking things off on Nitro and Hogan's got his world title back. Hulk lost to Roddy Piper inside the steel cage but Piper took a beating afterwards. The whole thing was messy and it wasn't much fun either. Hulk says he's still the man and when you're with Hollywood and the NWO you're with the boys for life. And now that Roddy Piper is gone, Hogan says the term icon won't be used so lightly. Hulk says he's the icon, and Hulk says he's God. That's right, Hulk Hogan is God. Hogan then challenges anyone to a fight including Sting and every fan in the arena. Bischoff plugs Assault on Devil's Island that premieres the following night on TNT. Hogan says he's taken over the wrestling world and tomorrow night he takes over Hollywood and that's all we've got. It appears that Roddy Piper has once again disappeared but you can certainly bet he'll be back in the future and he'll get pushed into another main event spot upon his return. Tony Schiavone confirms Hulk Hogan was defeated last night at the pay per view and Bobby Heenan reminds Hogan that he just issued an open challenge to the whole WCW locker room. Maybe he should have thought twice about that. New Cruiserweight Champion Rey Mysterio took on Dean Malenko next and Rey got a great ovation during his entrance. Malenko almost had Rey beat with his gut buster right here but Rey managed to get a hand on the bottom rope. Dean then countered the West Coast pop with a powerbomb, setting Rey up nicely for the cloverleaf but Rey was able to twist his body and counter with a roll up. Rey retains his Cruiserweight Championship. The Nitro girls dressed up for Halloween but Teo was late to the party because she was at the concession stands buying some snacks. Brilliant. The chairman of WCW then had a match with a fucking dude. Glacier. Oh, what the f Luke, even the Parker trolled him at the beginning of the match. The Parker done well to keep Wish.com Sub Zero in check, and it looked like we were going to see Glacier get destroyed with the help of the Parker's trusty chair, but no, of course not. That shit backfired. The Parker gets rocked with a cryonic kick, and Glacier wins via pinfall. DDP got some interview time next, and he says he knows it was Hogan who attacked him last night at the pay per view. Hogan knew that Savage was about to lose the Las Vegas sudden death match, and Hogan knows if Paige faces Savage in a one on one environment, Environment, then the macho man always gets banged. <laughs> yeah, banged. Paige doesn't think Hogan's a god. As a matter of fact, Dallas is going to accept Hulk's challenge and he's going to face him tonight one on one on Nitro. Larry Sabisco then came out for an interview and Larry says he was a fair referee last night and Scott Hall just couldn't take the pressure. The living legend is sick of Scott Hall, so he's only gone and got himself a match contract drawn up. Sabisco calls this a one way ticket to Larry Land and Hall gets called out. Scott says Larry isn't in the same league as the Wolfpack before giving a shout out to Kevin Nash. Hall says Sabisco couldn't even beat Eric Bischoff as a replay from Halloween Havoc gets shown. Sabisco tells Scott to get in the ring right now and let's get it on but Hall's not gonna bother. He promotes the Hogan vs DDP match instead, so Scott Hall has not signed his one way ticket to Larry Land. 
Raw kicks off with a Nation of Domination promo while Nitro continues on with a Lex Luger vs Stevie Ray match. Rocky Maivia is wearing his Team Rocket shirt tonight and I'm sure that one sold like hotcakes. Farouk isn't here to answer questions, he's here to ask Vince McMahon why is there racism in the World Wrestling Federation when weeks ago McMahon assured everyone that there was no such thing. McMahon apologises on behalf of the WWF for the nation's locker room getting vandalised last week, but Farouk doesn't want to hear it. McMahon could apologise for the last 400 years if he wants to, but Farouk is a new breed of black man who takes apologies with his fists. He punches apologies, I guess. McMahon says again there is no racism in the World Wrestling Federation before the nation kick him out of the ring, and Rocky takes a break from Pokemon exploitation to say a few words. He says the Heart Foundation made this a black and white thing. Maivia has dealt with discrimination all his life, but he always fought back and he always got back up. The Heart Foundation, though, won't be able to do the same thing when Rocky gets through with them. The nation challenged the Heart Foundation to a match next week, and then the Heart Foundation show up, and just like last week, they get cheered. Brett calls the nation his brothers before accepting the match challenge. He then says he comes from a country where there is no prejudice. In Canada, people are loved for what's inside, unlike America. Brett says Farouk got played last week, it was Shawn Michaels and his boy toy Triple H who wrecked the nation's locker room, and just then DX appear on the Titan Tron and Shawn says it was the Grand Wizard Bret Hart who vandalised the locker room, not DX. Triple H says Bret's leather jacket wasn't his first choice for entrance gear, he wanted a white hood and white sheets instead, fucking hell. DX says Bret was on the Jerry Springer show but we didn't know it was him because he had his hood on. And Triple H says he heard the Heart Foundation using the N-word as they trashed the locker room. The nation then attack the hearts and after the fight, Brett grabs his ankle. It looks like he's been injured and keep in mind, he has to face Ken Shamrock later tonight. Stevie Ray's back on Nitro and he's not competing in a tag team match, he's gonna see if he can do what his brother couldn't do and beat Lex Luger in a one on one match. Stevie overpowers Luger to begin with but Big Flexi Lexi puts Stevie down with a shoulder block. Stevie gives Lex a taste of his own medicine but Luger takes the lead with a hip toss and a scoop slam. Still, Stevie stays on Luger and he manages to pull off a falling power slam. Luger gets launched from corner to corner and then the total package finds himself in a bear hug. Luger counters and he performs the same hold but the classic ear clap gets Stevie out of trouble. Luger gets a boot up in the corner, he performs a few clotheslines, he signals for the rack but Stevie hooks the top rope and Luger can't apply it. Stevie performs a side axe kick but Luger's hard to beat tonight, Lex replies with a power slam, we then see the torture rack and Lex wins via submission. Raven and his buddies watch this one from the audience, WCW want to show us another Raven video and I hope he isn't hanging out doing kitty shit again and uh, for fucks sake climbing trees. Raven says we all need a haven, a place to hide and a place to escape, a place where the darkness won't be so frightening. He empathises with hopeless people and he feels their pain, quote the Raven nevermore, thanks Raven. Our favourite Depresso wrestles later tonight on Nitro for the first time ever. Eddie Guerrero vs Chris Jericho on Nitro, Triple H vs Goldust on Raw. Rick Rude told all these out of shape Tulsa tubs of crop to button their lips, open their eyes and pay attention to the king of the ring, the cornerstone of DX and the future of the World Wrestling Federation, Hunter Hearst Helmsley. This dude right here was shown on camera during Rick Rude's introduction, what a guy. I really thought we were done with this Triple H vs Goldust stuff but here we are once again. HBK joins the commentary team and he rips into the fine people of Tulsa, Oklahoma as Goldust takes control early on. He gets a little too confident and he goes flat flying over the top rope, and that's when China gets involved. Goldust goes down after a clothesline and Marlena thinks twice about going after China. Instead, she makes fun of Triple H while her husband's brain slowly falls out of his skull. Back in the ring, Triple H performs a top rope forearm and Goldust takes the Harley Race knee. Goldust tries to fight back but he takes the face break or knee smash, but eventually Goldust makes his comeback with a low uppercut followed by a clothesline. Hunter takes a bulldog before getting launched out of the ring. Marlena leaves her purse in the ring before walking over to Hunter and smacking the cerebral assassin across the face a few times. China takes the purse away from Goldust. Dustin gets whacked. This allows Hunter to hit the pedigree and Triple H wins. Marlena can't believe it. HBK rubs it into Vince and Jim Ross before telling the boys to suck it, and Vince McMahon isn't happy with Sean's language. 
Over on Nitro, Jericho's got his shoulder taped up, probably due to that botched Super Frankensteiner at Halloween Havoc, and this of course gives Eddie something to aim for. Magtane says the winner of this match will likely become the number one contender for the cruiserweight belt as Jericho lands a tilt a world backbreaker, but Eddie replies with a shoulder breaker and it already looks like Chris hasn't got a chance of winning this one. Guerrero lands a dropkick on the shoulder, he elbows the shoulder, he dropkicks it again, Jericho almost lands on his head again when trying to counter a back suplex, but he comes back with an excellent release German suplex followed by a double underhook powerbomb. Chris misses a lion's salt and Eddie goes upstairs, but Chris wakes up and he performs a superplex. He tries a lion tamer, but Eddie punches the shoulder and he breaks free. Jericho then tries to suplex Eddie out of the ring, but it does more damage to Chris than it does to Eddie. Eddie's able to get right back in the ring and Mike Tanay says Jericho's shoulder must have came out of its socket as Guerrero performs the frog splash. Eddie wins the match and Guerrero tells Rey Mysterio that their war isn't over before Nitro takes a commercial break. Cornette's commentary is up next and Owen Hart takes on Ahmed Johnson on Raw. On Nitro, the returning fit Finley bottles Chris Jericho. This is the Cornette clip that everyone remembers from these segments and for good reason too. Jim talks about the WCW Halloween Havoc cage match and he totally rips it apart. Cornette says he's sick and tired of people calling themselves the icon. Roddy Piper, Hulk Hogan, Macho Man Randy Savage, Shawn Michaels calls himself the icon that can still go and Bret Hart would call himself an icon too if he wasn't so busy complaining about the WWF screwing him over all the time. Cornette says Michaels is the best wrestler in the world inside the ring but outside the ring he's an adolescent obnoxious jerk who takes his tights and goes home if he doesn't get his way. Bret Hart meanwhile would have struck oil by now if he was screwed over as many times as he says he was. Boy, you ain't seen nothing yet, Jimmy. Randy Savage, Cornette admits he's a legend, but he asks viewers how many records did Frank Sinatra sell last year? It's a good point, actually. Cornette says the pinnacle of this icon garbage came at Halloween Havoc inside the steel cage. Jim says WCW had the gall to call this the greatest cage match in the history of wrestling when it's only the greatest since Hell in a Cell three weeks ago. And the cage match itself consisted of a bald movie star wannabe taking on a guy with an artificial hip who hasn't worked a full time schedule in 10 years. Cornette thinks it's a travesty that this match took place in the main event of what was the best card WCW could possibly put together and because Hogan and Piper were sucking wind within the 10 minute mark, they deprived fans in the front row of oxygen. Jim says the cage match was a slap in the face to every wrestler who takes pride in their profession. Guys like The Undertaker, Steve Austin and Ric Flair never claim to be icons, so they're big candidates to be just that. And Jim wraps it up with this timeless classic. And on a personal note to Hulk Hogan, you are a household word, but so is garbage, and it stinks when it gets old too. I'm Jim Cornette, and that's my opinion. The IC title was on the line in the Ahmed Johnson vs Owen Hart match, but Ahmed didn't really stand a chance. The Nation stood on the rampway keeping a close eye on both Owen and Ahmed, but the Nation were not the threat here, oh no. Steve Austin still wants to make sure that belt is kept around Owen Hart's waist, so the Rattlesnake once again helped out the King of Hearts by hitting a Stone Cold Stunner on Owen's opponent. Ok so that's good, but it's not what's important here. What is important is this sound Ahmed Johnson made while performing a scissors kick. With Owen Hart, has him doubled over and now oh, with that scissor kick, doubled over and now oh, with that scissor kick, doubled up, doubled up, doubled up, doubled up. <laughs> what was that? Anyway, big squealy boy Ahmed wins via disqualification, but Owen keeps his belt. Over on Nitro, the last time we saw Finley was back in April of 1996. He wasn't injured or anything, he went to Germany and he wrestled for the Catch Wrestling Association where he took over 20 bookings per month before coming back to WCW. He wasn't able to just walk back onto Nitro and start picking up wins though. He and Chris Benoit had a pretty hard hitting match here, but in the end the former Belfast Bruiser fell victim to the diving headbutt. These two would cross paths constantly throughout their careers, still wrestling each other nearly 10 years later in the WWE. This Nitro bout here wasn't bad, but they do have better matches in the future. We've got promos next from Mankind and Nature Boy Ric Flair. We also have a Riggs vs Raven match on Nitro. Before that though, guess what's back this week on WWF television? Oh yeah, the Milton Bradley Karate Fighters Tournament. Unfortunately though, our favourite karate fighter Cyberfist isn't going to compete this time because these are morphin karate fighters, the next generation of karate fighters. 
Vince McManigan and Jumbo Jim provide commentary. That's Bruce Pritchard right there. That's a misspelling of Mannequin right there. Although I can't really say anything with the amount of mistakes I make when putting these videos together. But um, who is this? Let me know in the comments because I have no idea. Anyway, we have Razor Job vs Sun Warrior, Jerry Lawler vs Brian Christopher. The King wins and he tells Brian to piss off because his mum's calling him. And here's the brackets for our illustrious tournament this year. Tito Santana's in there, Shrimp Scampi's there, who? And George and Adam from the WWF commercials are also gonna compete. Mankind tells Jim Ross that Dude Love wanted to have fun and make people smile, and even though Mankind thought he and Uncle Paul had an unspoken truce, what happened to Dude Love at the hands of Cain is unforgivable and Mankind has no choice but to make Paul's life a living hell. Mankind tells Paul to remember the Boiler Room match and the Buried Alive match, because Mankind's coming after Cain and he plans on stopping this path of destruction Cain's taken en route to The Undertaker. Commissioner Slaughter shows up and he says he won't approve a Kane vs Mankind match due to Mankind's mental condition and Kane's unrational behaviour. Mankind asks Sarge to please book the match but the commissioner won't do it for Mankind's own well-being. So Foley says in order to do horrible things to The Undertaker's little brother, he'll have to do something pretty bad right now. He then applies the mandible claw to Commissioner Slaughter and officials have to come in to stop Mankind. This dastardly act ends up getting Mankind what he wants in the end. Kane vs Mankind does take place at Survivor Series. Over on Nitro, Slick Rick doesn't say too much, he's just here to hype up tonight's upcoming matches. He says watching Kurt Hennig and Hulk Hogan walk around wearing his robe wasn't too much fun while he recovered from injury, but the show goes on and the battle plan hasn't changed. Tonight, Flair promises to get his hands on Kurt Hennig, he promises Hulk Hogan the DDP's gonna drop him with a diamond cutter, and in tonight's main event, once Ric Flair defeats the Macho Man in one minute, Liz can have a ride on Space Mountain. This next match here, Raven vs Riggs, is one of those matches I remember really really well, because I remember friends talking about it and wondering if the ending was legit. Of course it wasn't legit at all, we all got work like the good little gullible idiots we were, but anytime I think of the flock this match always comes to mind. This is Raven's first match on Nitro, apparently he still doesn't have a contract, so Stevie Richards says the only way Raven's gonna work this match is if it's contested without rules, it has to be a no disqualification match. Scotty Riggs and Nick Patrick agree before Raven grabs the mic, he offers Riggs a spot in his faction, he says Riggs hasn't won a match in 6 months, he can feel the pain inside of Scotty Riggs, so there's no need to fight, Scotty should just take a seat beside Smackhead Kidman and join up with the boys. Riggs refuses, Raven gives Scotty one more chance saying he'll set Scotty free, but Riggs tells Raven to beat it and so Raven decides he's actually gonna wrestle tonight. Raven pummels Riggs in the corner before delivering a butterfly suplex. Saturn then hands Raven a chair and Raven tries to set it up but he's stopped with a chop lock from Riggs. Raven fights back, he performs a drop toe hold, Riggs lands on the chair and he begins screaming in pain while holding his eye, and that's how the match ended. Kidman gets in the ring and he asks Raven if he can now have his daily dose of opium but he gets thrown out of the ring. It's a cold turkey day for BK. Raven just goes back to his seat and the commentators say Scotty Riggs career could be over after what just happened in this match. Bret Hart defends his WWF Championship next against Ken Shamrock, on Nitro we have that DDP vs Hogan match. That's right, Hogan's in a match right in the middle of the show, it's odd isn't it? Even Michael Buffer's here to introduce the competitors. So another big match for Dallas Page but one you know he isn't gonna win unfortunately. Still hopefully Hogan gets banged tonight. The two lock up and Hogan overpowers Dallas, the two then shove each other, they lock up again and Hogan brings DDP down with a hammer lock. Dallas breaks a wrist lock at the ropes but his offense gets stopped in the corner and it looks a little shaky for a moment. Hollywood headbutts Dallas, he punches Dallas, he kicks at Dallas's injured ribs, Dallas goes down after a clothesline and he once again hits the mat after a knee to the face. Total domination here from Hollywood Hogan brothers. Page ends up countering a wrist lock and he goes after Hulk's shoulder. He can't drop Hulk with the cutter and Hulk realises he was close to losing the match, so he takes a moment on the outside. When the match resumes, Dallas floors Hulk with a lariat and once again Hulk bails out of the ring. Hulk has to drive his fingers into Dallas's throat to get an advantage when the two get back inside, and Hogan gets warned here by Randy Anderson. Hulk drops a few elbows and he chokes Dallas on the mat, 
Dallas gets thrown out of the ring and he hits the guardrail, and Hogan delivers a few chops on the outside before backdropping Dallas on the mats. It's noteworthy that Hogan's done more in this match here than what he did last night at Halloween Havoc. When the two get back inside the ring, Page counters a hip toss with a swinging neckbreaker, only scoring a two count. Hogan has to poke Dallas in the eye to turn things back in his favour, and he delivers an inverted atomic drop. We see another clothesline, more kicks to the ribs, and Hogan continues the beating by hitting Page with a corner clothesline. Hulk looks very proud of his handiwork here. Dallas gets suplexed before he starts fighting back. He punches Hogan out of the ring and he stays on Hollywood at the guardrail, but the momentum stops when Hulk delivers a big boot. Hogan goes goes for the leg drop, Page dodges it, he signals for the diamond cutter but then a shit sting shows up. Dallas drops the imposter with a diamond cutter but the ref calls for the bell and Page is gonna win via DQ. Hogan whips Dallas with his belt, the NWO then show up to destroy Dallas, but the real sting appears from the audience and he ends up getting inside the ropes to take on the whole NWO, minus Kevin Nash, on his own. Sting drops Vincent, Scott Hall and Kurt Hennig with Scorpion death drops. The fake Sting gets escorted to the back by Hogan, Six and Bischoff, and the segment ends with the crowd going absolutely crazy at the sight of Sting destroying everything in sight. Bret Hart vs Ken Shamrock then, it feels like we're covering the main events at the moment but we're only halfway through Raw and two thirds through Nitro. Bret's a bit thrown off with Shamrock's fighting stance but the two lock up and the two trade hammer locks. Shamrock takes the lead with a headlock takedown, he then applies a leg lock though Bret makes it to the ropes. Shamrock focuses on the injured knee as Vince McMahon invites viewers to join the WWF the following night for a special Survivor Series flashback show. McMahon then makes fun of Hulk Hogan in the cage match, saying fans won't see Hulk compete in another bad match but rather the WWF will show The Undertaker vs Hogan from Survivor Series 1991 when Hulk Hogan was in his prime. Bret comes back with a series of strikes but Shamrock knows how to throw punches too. The veteran sees an opportunity though when he delivers a chop lock and then we go into familiar territory with Brett targeting the leg and knee. Brett goes through his usual offense here, softening Shamrock up for the sharpshooter and Shamrock does a really good job of selling it too. Before we go to break, Brett performs a spinning toe hold and we come back to see Shamrock still getting badly punished by the excellence of execution. Brett goes for the figure 4 again but Shamrock manages to counter it. Kenny Boy continues to do a great job selling the leg and I really do hope he remembers to keep this up. Brett gets thrown into the ring steps and Brett gets clobbered beside the timekeeper's table. Shamrock gets all fired up and he shouts at Vince McMahon and and this gives Brett a chance to grab a chair and bring it back into the ring. Shamrock stops Brett from using it though and he nails Brett with a big forearm smash. He then performs a Frankensteiner and he counters a side rushing leg sweep with a suplex. We think things aren't looking too good for the hitman right now but he replies with a clothesline and then he tries the sharpshooter. Ken counters it with an ankle lock but the referee takes a bump and there's no one to call for the bell when Brett tops out. Shamrock checks on the referee, Brett nails him with a chair, Brett then locks in the the sharpshooter one more time, but Shawn Michaels shows up and the WWF champ gets rocked with sweet chin music. As HBK beats down Brett, Shamrock notices what's going on. He completely loses it and he starts wailing on HBK after a belly to belly suplex. D-Generation X hit the ring, the Hart Foundation hit the ring, officials hit the ring. Shamrock leaves while HBK and Brett try to get back to their feet but when they do they start fighting again. This happens a couple of times as everyone in the ring struggles to keep Sean and Brett separated. Sean eventually leaves the ring though and he gets carried up the rampway while Brett reminds fans at home that he's still number one. Decent match here, you'll probably enjoy this one. Road Dogg and Badass Billy Gunn take on the new Blackjacks on Raw while Disco Inferno defends his TV title against Bill Goldberg. So Goldberg defeated Mike Anthony on WCW Saturday night, he's now officially 6-0. This match with the Inferno doesn't get started so Goldberg remains 6-0 after this week's episode of Nitro. Someone's here to attack Goldberg, someone wants a bit of revenge. No time to swing the bratwurst this week, gotta kill that fucking Goldberg bitch. Oh, big bratwurst. This is Alex's big chance to make an impact. Destroy him, Alex. End this streak nonsense before it gets out of. Ah, fuck's sake. Alright, Alex gets jackhammered. Disco gets speared and jackhammered. 
Big Steve McMichael comes back to reclaim his Super Bowl ring and he too gets speared and that's how it ends. Officials try to hold these big football boys down as absolute chaos breaks out in the ring. In short, a bad night for our lads Disco and Daz Wunderkind and absolute destruction from Billy Goldberg. Bret Hart says everywhere he goes, he sees Shawn Michaels' face. I'll beat up the whole family if you get in my face one more time. Bret says he's right back to where he was a long time ago, having to complain about Shawn Michaels. Bret says though, after Survivor Series, he won't have to worry about it anymore. Uh huh, well, whatever happens, Bret's gonna get his hands around the HBK's scrawny little neck, and once and for all, we'll see the end of Shawn Michaels. Road Dogg and Billy Gunn come out to face the new Blackjacks. Absolutely nobody cared about the new Blackjacks, and I think they've been booked only twice on TV since WrestleMania 13. Folks were still unsure about this new tag team of James and Gunn, so what we end up with here is a pretty flat crowd for this tag team encounter on Raw. Plus, they had to follow a WWF Championship match. It was destined to go down the shitter, really, wasn't it? Vince McMahon again rips in the Hogan's new movie as Vinnie Mac promotes the Survivor Series flashback show. The BJs take the lead early on, with Justin Hawk Bradshaw not even needing any assistance from Barry Windham, but Barry gets in the ring anyway and the Road Dog takes a double back elbow. The mood comes down a little when McMahon announces that Gorilla Monsoon's wife Maureen isn't doing too well in hospital at the moment, and the WWF send their thoughts and prayers to the Morella family. McMahon confirms she's very, very ill. The Blackjacks dominated the whole match until Billy Gunn grabbed the chair and he hit Bradshaw from behind. Jesse James then pinned Bradshaw and the Road Dog and BA Billy Gunn win their second Raw match as a tag team. The Godwins then come down to attack Wyndham and Bradshaw, and you may be thinking this is completely random, and indeed it is. But it's that time of year when WWF throws together any old shit to form Survivor Series teams, and all these boyos in the ring, and the headbangers who arrive a little late, are going to compete in a traditional Survivor Series match to kick off the pay-per-view. In the ultimate act of disrespect, an act even worse than the nation getting their locker room destroyed, Billy Gunn and Jesse James destroyed the BJ's sick hats. Those rascals. I must say though, I like the headbangers repaired boombox. Good job. We've got promos next, Hollywood Hogan on Nitro, Kane and Paul Bearer on Raw. Just like last week, Hogan makes three appearances during a single episode of Nitro. And you know why he's making all these appearances on Nitro, don't you? That's tried right, to promote Assault on Devil's Island on TNT. But there's another announcement that gets made here that's pretty significant. Bischoff's got a sign that says Sting can't dance, and I don't remember Sting saying he could dance. Alex Wright can dance though. Hogan says he doesn't need to worry about DDP anymore, he doesn't need to worry about Sting because we all saw the look of fear in Sting's eyes when he got in the ring. Hulk says he'll kick Sting's rear end out the back before moving on to quote, more positive momentum, and that is Assault on Devil's Island tomorrow night on TNT, and all you j Brones better tune in. Hogan says he'll be in Vegas during the movie and he'll have a match contract for Sting. If Sting's got the guts, he can show up and sign it. But the bottom line is, Hogan's a wrestling god and the NWOites, fuck I hate that. The NWOites better tune in to TNT tomorrow night or Hulk will show up at their door and drop the leg, brother. So during the movie, TNT are going to cut to a press conference where Sting would sign the match contract. We'll check that out on next week's show of course, but now the WWF Survivor Series flashback show that also airs tomorrow night makes a lot more sense. Alright, serious matters at hand. Jim Ross is here to interview Paul Bear, and Kane stands right next to him, looking very intimidating. Ross says, it's official, Mankind vs Kane happens at Survivor Series. Paul wants to know what Kane has to do to get his message across. Mankind is just an idiot, a little pebble on Kane's path of destruction. Paul says the reason Kane is here is to make The Undertaker's life a living hell. And Paul can't believe that The Undertaker had the audacity to crawl out of his hole last week and say he's already living in hell when the dead man really doesn't have a clue. Undertaker doesn't know what living in hell is really like, but his little brother certainly knows. He burned in hell's fire and it was all thanks to The Undertaker. Paul says The Undertaker will continue to live in hell until he steps up and faces his brother. Taker will meet his judgement day. Rest in peace, ashes to ashes. 
Legit looking forward to seeing Cain vs Mankind again though at Survivor Series, I remember there being a lot of intrigue about that match and I haven't watched it in a long time. We find out what tonight's Raw main event's gonna be and uh, no idea what they're playing at here. We also see Shawn Michaels dirty old asshole on Raw, he and Triple H fall asleep as McMahon tries to ask a few questions, so Rick Rude chimes in and he says the only person Shawn wants to speak to right now is the hitman Bret Hart. Shawn then pulls out his mouth from the south and it gets shown on TV. That's not what's funny though, what's funny is Vince McMahon's reaction, he just gives up. We have Mark Merrow vs Flash Funk next on Raw, while over on Nitro the Steiner brothers take on Public Enemy. Sable's out here doing what she does best but JR and Vince McMahon can't stop talking about Sean's hoop. They can't believe what Michaels just did and they say this is a new low in professional wrestling. Mega heel Mark Merrow doesn't want to shake hands with Flash Funk, he applies a headlock, he takes Funk down with a shoulder block but Funk takes the lead with a hip toss, a dropkick and an arm drag. Flash does a little damage in the corner but Mero performs a Samoan drop and he goes upstairs. Funk makes sure that Sable gets a night off when Mero smashes his little wild man on the top turnbuckle, but still Mero fights Funk off and he performs a sweet moonsault that only gets a two count. Mero throws a few body shots but Funk comes back with his front spin kick, it doesn't put Mero away so Flash performs a Funker splash, he then lands a moonsault of his own that looked great too but Mero kicks out of two. Marvelous Mark hits a low blow just like last week and he puts Flash away with a spinning TKO. I wish this one was a little longer because these two worked well together. On Nitro, Scotty Steiner thanks the fans for their support after a tough year for the Steiner brothers and he thanks the NWO for coming up with Wolfpack rules effectively letting the Steiners win the tag team titles without Kevin Nash being in the ring. Ted DiBiase says Rick and Scott trusted him when they didn't have to and they took a chance on the former million dollar man. DiBiase says the Steiners deserve to be tag team champions after everything they went through with the NWO, but Rick and Scott intend on defending the tag team belts unlike the outsiders. The Steiners then issue an open challenge to anyone who wants a shot. The public enemy have a match with Rick and Scott and flyboy Rocco Rock felt the wrath of Scotty Steiner. Rick and Johnny gets tagged in and Grunge gets put down with Rick's scoop power slam and it really looked like the public enemy regretted their decision to wrestle tonight. There's a real fuck up here with the timing, Nitro has to go to commercial break and the guys in the ring are notified as usual but it takes an extra minute or so for Nitro to cut away. What we end up getting is Rick and Johnny Grunge staring at each other in the ring while they wait for that break to happen. When we come back it's right back to action with Scott and Rocco Rock in the ring, Scott gets thrown out and Grunge drops Scott over the guardrail and Scott Scott struggles to tag Rick back in as the public enemy begin utilizing some double team moves. You know how this goes, Scott gets a break after taking both guys out, Rick then comes in to clean house. At this point I just begin wondering what moves the Steiners are going to pull off to end the match and this time it's the Steiner Bulldog. Rick and Scott defeat the public enemy as expected. I should mention too that the commentators didn't call a single move in this match, they spent all their time telling viewers to watch Assault on Devil's Island tomorrow night on TNT. I'm deadly serious too, they didn't talk about the match for a single second. Jeff Jarrett buries WCW next on Raw with a sit down interview with JR while Booker T gets a shot at Kurt Hennig's US title. There's quite a serious tone to this Double J interview, Jim Ross wants to know why Double J left the WWF in the first place. Jarrett says Vince McMahon had a vision for who Double J was gonna be, McMahon put limitations on Jarrett but Jeff still succeeded. Jarrett didn't want to be the Double J character and he just wanted to be Jeff Jarrett. We see clips of In Your House too, the brilliant Jarrett vs Shawn Michaels Match. The discussion then goes straight to WCW so they act like In Your House 2 was Jarrett's final night in WWF, completely ignoring the fact that he came back to the company, appearing at In Your House 5 and wrestling at the 1996 Royal Rumble pay per view. Jarrett says while Vince McMahon gave him an opportunity to be Double J, in WCW he had no opportunities at all. He walked into the company in a certain spot on the cards and he left in the same spot. He says if you're not one of Eric Bischoff's boys and you don't have strong enough stroke you don't get the spotlight. Double J says there's some big names in WCW and the talent's track record speaks for itself but if you put Jarrett vs Michaels against any match in WCW or any match in Japan for that matter, the Jarrett vs Michaels match would be better. In WCW, in ring talent doesn't matter, it's all about being in Bischoff's clique. 
He says, in the World Wrestling Federation, it's action from bell to bell at arena shows, but in WCW, it's not like that at all. Their top wrestlers are all over their 40s, and the WWF maybe has just one guy over 40 on their active roster. Jarrett sees that as a problem. There's more to this interview and we'll see it next week, and apparently Jeff's gonna rip into guys like Hulk Hogan and Shawn Michaels. Over on Nitro, you know, that place where Jeff Jarrett didn't get any opportunities, Booker gets a shot at a singles title, and after his performance last week against Luger, I was really rooting for him here. Even though I know he doesn't win the US title yet, I still wanted to see him perform well. Unfortunately, and surprisingly, seeing this was a 3-hour episode of Nitro, Kurt and Booker's ring time is seriously limited. Booker throws Kurt into the corner, he applies a side headlock, Kurt goes down after a shoulder block and he takes a brilliant hip toss before taking his regular time out on the outside. He then gets in a cheap shot during a corner break and he goes on offense with a kick to the head followed by a knife edge chop. We see a swinging neck breaker from Hennig followed by a chin lock and Booker gets sent to the outside when Kurt kicks out of a pin attempt. It's all moving along so so fast. Back in the ring Booker tries to end it with a unique schoolboy pin but Kurt gets out by poking Booker in the eye and then Miss Elizabeth makes her way down to the ring. Booker hits a spinning heel kick that didn't look too hot, he covers Kurt, Liz gets on the apron and then the match man Randy Savage shows up to drop an elbow on Booker. Ric Flair then runs down and he goes straight after Kurt Hennig, and it ends with Flair chasing Kurt back up the entranceway. It's a dud unfortunately, and you can really tell they were rushing through this one as quickly as possible. Alright, so Ric Flair battles Randy Savage in our Nitro main event and Los Bariquas take on the Legion of Doom on Raw. Those tag team belts just look right on Hawk and Animal, don't they? Jesse James and Billy Gunn sit at ringside for this one and they won't tell JR why they're here. We've got Savio Vega and Miguel Perez representing the Bariquas, masters of the nerve pinch, but Hawk and Animal won't be giving these guys a chance to pinch any nerves tonight. They do start off as the aggressors and while LOD are busy with their opponents inside the ropes, Gunn and James steal Hawk and Animal's shoulder pads. Animal hits a powerbomb on Savio Vega and Hawk gets tagged in to take care of Miguel Perez Jr. We see Hawk's neckbreaker, but then the road warrior misses a shoulder charge in the corner and this allows Miguel and Savio to take advantage. Gunn and James are now wearing the LOD's entrance gear while Hawk tries to deal with the Bariquas. He breaks through a clothesline and he delivers a double clothesline and Jesse James was supposed to trip Hawk up on the outside, but he ends up catching Miguel instead. That right there ends the match and just let that sink in for a moment. A trip and a fall led to a three count in the Raw main event. LOD chase Gunn and James, the Bariquas chase LOD. You may think Raw ended really badly this week, but wait, there's more. Ahmed Johnson hasn't gotten over Steve Austin's stunner and he says Austin entered Ahmed's zone by putting his hands on him. Ahmed says, and I quote, my zone is kinda like an end zone. Once you're in there, you score. So you just scored on me. <laughs> wait, 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 there's more. Ahmed says it's his turn now to score on Austin. Slick Rick vs Randy Savage is already underway when we come back from Nitro's final commercial break. I remember this match quite well also and the majority of it happens around the ring. It's all brawling here and it makes things a little difficult to talk about because there's not a lot to say but I'll give it a shot. The fight goes into the audience almost immediately and we can't see a thing that happens. We do see Doug Dillinger looking stressed out though. They go back to the guardrails where Flair hits Nick Patrick with an elbow. That really doesn't play into the match at all so I'm not sure why he done that. Rick then clears a little space so he can launch Macho over the guardrail. Savage takes a knife edge chop and Savage fights back by choking Flair with his shirt before ramming him into the guardrail. Flair comes back with a flurry of punches before kicking Randy in the balls, and Randy replies by taking Dave Penzer's microphone and using it as a weapon. This one's been pretty chaotic so far. This kind of back and forth fighting continues until Macho hides behind Liz and Slick Rick gives Liz a big old kiss. You think this is going to give Savage an opening but Flair punches the Macho Man and finally the match gets inside the ring. A hard chop gets followed up by a back elbow and Rick sends a message to Miss Elizabeth afterwards. She's got a fast pass for Space Mountain but she hands it back by breaking Slick Rick in the face. Macho has no interest in keeping this one inside the ropes so they go straight back to the outside and 
what can I say here, it's more back and forth fighting, with no one getting an advantage. Savage misses a double axe handle though from the top and it looks like he whacks his chin on the guardrail, this was the moment of the match. The two get back in the ring where Macho takes a back suplex and that's it over. Kurt Hennig interferes, the referee calls for the bell, Savage attacks Rick with the US belt, Slick Rick takes an elbow drop and Kurt Hennig repays Rick for what he did at Halloween Havoc by placing the US title on Rick's face before the belt gets stomped by the former Mr. Perfect. If you're into brawls, and I don't mean fighting factions, then you might enjoy this one. In comparison to what Raw put on though during its last 5 minutes, I'd say Nitro was better. Two pretty good shows this week but I'm giving it to Raw, it felt like WCW lost control a little during its final 60 minutes with a lot of timing issues and they struggled to adjust to 3 hours this week which is strange seeing as they done well before with the extra time. Bret vs Shamrock, Mankind's promo, Cornette's commentary and Jeff Jarrett's promo were good on Raw. I liked the Raven and Scotty Riggs bit on Nitro and seeing Hogan actually wrestle a bit on Nitro was a change of pace too. Nitro did have good variety throughout but nothing really stood out. Raw and Nitro both have 46 points on our leaderboard and we've got 13 ties. In the television ratings Raw got a 2.3, Nitro gets a 4.3 this week. Next week it's the Raw Before Survivor Series 1997, Ahmed Johnson wants to score in Steve Austin's end zone so we'll see what happens there, Marlena and Goldust have an interesting conversation and the British Bulldog takes on Vader in a dog collar match. On Nitro, the commentary team are forced to talk about wrestling and not assault on Devil's Island, Disco Inferno takes on Perry Saturn, Scott Hall wrestles Chris Jericho and Space Mountain meets the big Bravvers when Ric Flair takes on Alex Wright. Make sure you come over next week and we'll do it all again. Thanks for watching guys and take care.